It just might be the greatest sports franchise in the history of sports. A place where legends are made, and there's always something to talk about. Get ready to immerse yourself in pinstripes. Start spreading the news, hosted by Paul Semendinger and E.J. Fagan, a couple of doctors with a prescription for Yankee fever. And now, here's Dr. Paul Semendinger and Dr. E.J. Fagan. Get ready to start spreading the news. This is a presentation of Northeast Streaming Sports. All right, my friends, welcome to Monday evening. This is Start Spreading the News. Paul Semendinger here with EJ Fagan in just one moment. Let me get the uh, advertisement put out there right now. Start Spreading the News is brought to you by Artemisia Publishing, a small independent publisher creating quality books from quality authors. The world is filled with amazing stories, and Artemisia has been on the cusp of the indie publishing scene with their award-winning stories for 20 years. You can check out all of their titles at apbooks.net, and you can order their books from your favorite bookseller or online. That's apbooks.net for your next reading adventure. And of course, they published my award-winning novel, Scattering the Ashes. If you haven't read this yet, your life is incomplete. And one of these days, a movie producer is going to reach out to me and say, my goodness, this is the next great movie. What do I need to do to get the rights to Scattering the Ashes? Because it's going to be huge because the story is just amazing. So if you haven't seen it yet, and if you're a movie producer and you haven't decided to buy the rights to it yet, do it quickly because your life will be better when you do. So anyway, my dear friends, here is our good friend, Dr. EJ, back from vacation. Doctor, how are you? Doing pretty great. Had a week in Arizona. Uh, got some spring training baseball in uh, Salt River Field, which is where the Arizona Diamondbacks play. I uh, got to see a wonderful game of, of uh, Diamondbacks against the Seattle Mariners. Wow. Uh, and the great thing about spring training, especially in Arizona, you know, you may have gone to see the Yankees in spring training and the prices are expensive, right? They're major league prices. Um, in Arizona, that is not the case. <laughs> um, we got the uh, first row behind the visiting dugout for $46 a ticket uh, on a beautiful day, took in some sun, uh, saw some baseball split squad games. I didn't see a lot of great Mariners out there, but saw, saw some fun Diamondbacks. And uh, it was a good way to kind of feel like the the real season's it's coming. It's almost here. At Thursday, Yankees open on yeah. Thursday. So yeah, by the time the next time we talk, the Yankees will have played a few games, and let's hope they will have won a few games. Yeah, seven games to start the season. That's a, that's a lot. That's a it's gonna be a busy uh, busy week for the Yankees. Normally, you get a couple of off days right in here, but they're playing in domes, so they're they're just gonna go. Which um. It, you know, I kind of like, I, I like saving those off days till a little bit later. They have a nice steady stream of off days in April. It's like every Thursday, I think after the first Thursday, but uh, it's, uh, it's going to be a little different. They got to play five starters right away. They got to play every, you know, play guys basically back to back, you know, on a normal schedule right away. And, uh, and I think that's refreshing. It's going to be exciting. Um, you have a rule that says on the Bronx beat podcast, you have to predict that the Yankees are going to win the pennant. Is that correct? Yes. All right. Um, so I don't have that rule, but I'm going to assume that you're predicting that the Yankees will win the pennant. I'm going to now, first off, let me say, this is why you should have the rule because it's lame if you don't. Right. I mean, come on, like we're <laughs> Yankees fans, we're supposed to be, have a little bit of fun here. <laughs> and um, and so yeah, so my official prediction for the World Series, I never make a real prediction, I make a fun prediction, uh, is a revenge game. The Arizona Diamondbacks have made the World Series for the second year in a row. It's game six. Randy Johnson has thrown out the ceremonial first pitch in Arizona. Uh, and uh, the Yankees, they 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 tie the game. It's the 10th inning. It is no midnight strikes. It's November 1st, right after midnight. Uh, and the MVP of the 2024 World Series, Anthony Volpe, steps to the plate and he hits 
uh, the next Mr. November home run, Anthony Volpe, hero of the 2024 World Series. We finally get revenge over the Diamondbacks. The bloody sock curse has been put to rest. Um, and uh, and that is, that is how it's going to go down. Just you right here first. I love it. I love it. And I love it. Um, I like predictions like that because it's a fun prediction. I, I, I real predictions. I'm, 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 I don't really do anymore because they're just silly, but how I mean, there's no point in doing real predictions other than Pakoda, right? Just, just, mm-hmm. just pick the projection system. They're, they're better at it than we are. And I always hate it when, you know, people try to try to make real predictions like they're smarter than the, than the machine. And AI, you know, the, the, the machines are good at this um, and humans are not. This is the kind of thing that machines are supposed to be good at. Now, do I think the Yankees are better than their 92 in projection? I do. And there's a reason for that. And that's because I think the, the, the projections are wrong on three players, Rizzo, Judge, and Soto. Soto and Judge, you know, they are otherworldly players that Pakota just has, does a terrible time predicting, right? It's, they're, it's not equipped to handle, you know, top one, you know, 0.001% players in Major League history. I think both of those players are kind of up there for, for different reasons. And then Rizzo, gave, Pakota gave Rizzo a terrible projection. Um, but that's because he, they, it, Pakoda does know that he had a concussion last year, that he was playing injured for two months. Um, you know, they look like, it looked like Rizzo had a very normal kind of, you know, mid thirties final collapse, which is kind of normal among baseball players. But, um, we actually have a pretty good explanation for that. And so I think Rizzo is going to have to perform that projection. So maybe a win or two better than 92, but I think the Yankees are a low to mid nineties win team. The good news is that uh, the World Series last year was between a 90-win Texas Rangers and, what, an 86-win Diamondbacks or something like that, just a, a, a real mediocre Diamondbacks team. So uh, so it's plausible. So here, let's – I nothing you're saying is incorrect or inaccurate. Does Pakoda – quick question, does that Pakoda ranking consider a full season of Garrett Cole at this point? Uh, that Pakoda ranking does uh, it, it does include Garrett Cole's um, uh, injury. I don't know how many games they expect Cole back for. But what they, they do is they modify that. So they actually went down from ninety four to ninety two wins uh, when Cole got injured. So pretty All big. Right. It's only pretty it's, big it's loss. Only two. All right. I, yeah, I well, would think, you think I about think it, Cole's a five win player, right? So if you mm-hmm. if you lose him for for a couple of months and replace him with a replacement level player, that's that's about two wins. Two 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 and a half. All right. So let me ask you. Here's 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 the crazy part of your prediction. You've seen Mariano Rivera. Mariano Rivera is just about my age, so he's mid-50s. He might be a year or two older than me, but I think he's actually a few years younger than me. He might be early 50s. Mariano Rivera looks to be in great shape. So to add to your prediction for the Yankees against Arizona, it's mid-August, and the Yankees' bullpen is just exhausted and Brian Cashman, it's past the trade deadline. He's called everybody looking in waiver wires. There's nothing out there. And it just so happens that it's old timers day. And he looks out on the field and he sees Mariano Rivera and he thinks, no. And so they're joking after old timers day in, in a luxury box or something. And he's like, you couldn't still throw. And Mariano says, sure, sure. I can. I actually, I, I do. I, I have a baseball pitching machine, uh, app- not a machine, like an apparatus, a bullpen apparatus at a friend's house or in a college campus or my basement or something. And yeah, you know, I still, I still hit mid eighties when, when I really ramp it up and I throw, you know, once a week or so just because I love doing it. And Cashman says, I need a pitcher. And, uh, Mar- Mariano says, well, you know, I'm kind of bored now anyway. And so Mariano gets signed by the Yankees on August 31st. So he's postseason eligible and he pitches down the stretch to a 3.45 ERA. And then he pitches the seventh inning of that game seven, striking out the side to help the Yankees get to that bottom of, or I guess the top of the ninth or whatever for Volpe to hit the big home run. What do you think? You know, I think uh, Mariano Rivera is 54 years old. He's playing a non-contact sport. He's the greatest there ever was. And Gordie Howe scored 15 goals in the National Hockey League at the age of 51. So why not? Um, yeah, look, I, I, yeah, look, I, do I think Rivera could still get better at that? Yes, I do. Yeah, that would be fun. That would be awesome. So along those same lines, I have a more, you, you had an article. We just ran it uh, today 
on the fact that the Yankees have very little depth on the infield and DJ LeMayhew is going to start the year on yeah. the IL. And two weeks ago and three weeks ago, and on the Bronx Speak podcast, we talked about some possibilities for the Yankees to build up their bench. And I just came up with the most absurd, maybe, option that no one has even thought about, I don't think. And in order to first set the framework for that option as the Yankee reserve bat off the bench, backup infielder, backup first baseman who could maybe fill the gap here, I need to talk about a star of the late 60s and 70s named Burt Campanaris. Do you know about Burt Campanaris? I know the name, but... All right, so Burt Campanaris came up in 1964. His first full season was 65. He led the league in stolen bases for the old Kansas City A's and then was part of those great A's teams in the early 70s. Led the league in stolen bases uh, in 65, 66, 67, 68, and 70. He was an MVP candidate in 65, 66, 68, 70, 72, 73, 74, and 75, finishing as high as... 11th or 10th in the MVP vote. He was an all-star six times, it looks like. He led the league in hits once. That was 1968 with 177. He had a lifetime 259 batting average, but he was better than that for the most part in those years. He was a dynamic, great ball player. Now, his career basically fizzled out as so many people's careers fizzle out in 1977. He or 1978, he hits only 186. In 1979, over two teams, he hits 230. In 1980, he plays in only 77 games, manages a 252 batting average. And in 1981, he manages only 55 games, hits 256, and that's it. In 1982, he plays in Mexico. In 1983, the Yankees... I think I know who you're talking about. Okay. Yes, you do now. And the Yankees call him up out of Mexico, and he hits and plays in 60 games and hits 322. There's a former All-Star who has a similar type of thing. MVP votes, led the league in some things. He was a pretty good hitter. Named Robinson Cano, who happens to be playing in the Mexican League. He can fake it at second. He can fake it at third. He played a couple innings in his career. At, uh, excuse me. He can fake it at first. Played a couple innings in his career at third base. The Yankees need an infielder. Robbie Cano. What do you think? I mean, I had the exact same thought watching the game. Right? He he got he hit. He, he's one of the few guys uh, on either team that, that got hits in that first, that first game. Um. You know, I think that there's worse ideas in the world. I, I, he's in shape, clearly. Um, he clearly likes baseball. He's a Yankee. He performed professionally. You know, I think, um, I, I, I don't think we should let people's careers be derailed because they got suspended for steroids. And Cano got suspended twice, I believe. And, um, that's not good. That's going to cause him problems when he would have been a surefire Hall of Famer. Um, but you know, I think, I I think that as a forty year old bench player, Robinson Cano looks like he can still hit. I think he could probably fake it at third. Could probably fit place in first. Excuse me. And uh, I, I I think you're not wrong. I think he could be an interesting player. Um, I don't think it's going to happen. But I think that's the exact kind of bench player the Yankees should be supporting. And look, they can always cut him. Right, they can always let him play for a little bit. I think he's probably better than Kevin Smith. Um, and if he doesn't play well, well, then you know, say thank you know, you know, thank you for your time, and we've reset your Hall of Fame clock to to this year. Um, you know what's interesting? I read I read a report. I guess it was in the New York Post. Somebody said, "Are you playing in the Mexican League so that you can make it back to the majors?" And he said, basically, said, "No, I'm playing in the Mexican League because I still love playing baseball." Yeah. Isn't that the kind of guy? I understand the steroids and stuff, but isn't that the kind of guy you want on your team? A guy who's just thrilled to be playing baseball? I I agree. Um, look, Cano had one season that where he was not good. So 2022, he hit 150. Bounced around a bunch of different teams, didn't play a lot, was pretty badly injured. But he hit in the minors that year. He hit a triple A and he hit. Up until you know, up until the moment he was suspended from the, from the Mets, he was hitting 316 at the age of 37 when he was suspended from the Mets. Maybe he was injured in 2022. Maybe his heart wasn't in it. I don't know. 
Um, I I think my bet is that Robinson Cano is going to be a better hitter this year than Oswaldo Cabrera, and maybe not a better defender, but you know you can have them both. Um, the Yankees right now are short an infielder. DJ LeMay is going to miss at least a week. Uh, it feels like his foot is cursed <laughs> um, because just complete this weird things keep happening to DJ LeMay I think front foot. Uh, but um, you know, I think even when he returns, I think there's room on this team for uh, a solid pinch hitter who can still make contact, who's a veteran presence and is someone that I think all of us as Yankee fans kind of like. I remember the thing, it was on Jimmy Kimmel or one of them. I don't watch late night TV, but after he went to the Mariners, they, they did like an on the street interview yeah. and, and he was standing behind in like in a box or something with this picture on it. And the, they were asking people, look, he's mm-hmm. now a Mariner. You can boo the picture. And they'd go up to the picture and be like, boo, Robbie, boo you. And then Robbie would walk around out of the box or come from behind the picture. And they'd be like, boo, oh, hey, Robbie, good to see you. <laughs> that was that was one of the best late night bits I've ever oh, seen. Oh, it was great. And and, you know, and and that was also the most, booing Cano was one of the dumbest things that Yankee fans did back in the day. This idea that Cano was like dogging in the, in the field or something just ridiculous. My favorite version of that, though, I don't know if, you've, if you saw, is when Judge was a rookie. Um, Jimmy Kimmel put him put like a pair of like Clark Kent glasses on him and had him interview people uh, and about Aaron Judge. And it was just fantastic. So, oh, um, I, I, I've heard about that. Maybe maybe I saw it because it's ringing a little bell, but I don't remember. It's great. There, there's also a wonderful one where Jimmy Kimmel interviewed people about Mike Tyson uh, and then Mike Tyson was standing behind them. It was it was fantastic. Uh, oh, my so, God. So Kimmel, Kimmel's, Kimmel does this, this stuff pretty well. I should note. Um, un, mostly unrelated, but in my upcoming book, The Thinkers, The Rise of Partisan Think Tanks and the Polarization of American Politics, uh, there is a an original, not previously reported story about Jimmy Kimmel in the book. Really? It is uh, a story that I interviewed somebody and they told me the story and I had to had to go talk to a bunch of people, other people to verify because it, it was that good. Wow. I can't wait to yeah. hear it. Yep. When does the book come out, EJ? June 12th. I can't wait. Can't wait. All right. So why don't we get to the big story? I, I'm, I'm very interested to hear your impression. We don't have any facts. I think he's going to talk to the media tomorrow. He talked to the media today. Oh, okay. I So I missed it. Shohei Otani, what do you think? And what did he say to the media today? Yeah, you know, um, I my thoughts on this have evolved over the, la- over the last few days. So when the story first broke, and you know, for anybody who doesn't who's living under a rock, I'll just kind of briefly summarize it. The story first broke. The story was was that uh, there was an investigation into a bookie. This is an illegal bookie where sports gambling is still illegal in uh, California. That investigation uh, turned up the name Shohei Otani. Shohei Otani had been. Um, uh, uh, or rather the, the bookie had been bragging to people that Shohei Otani was one of his clients. So it was like an advertising feature to him. Obviously that would be very bad. That'd be very much against baseball's rules. Even if he wasn't betting on baseball, you're not allowed to use an illegal bookie in baseball. If you bet on other sports, you have to do it through uh, normal legal channels. Turns out that, uh, or at least the, the, the story then focuses on uh, his translator, Mizuzaka, I believe is how you pronounce the name. Um, who had been Otani's translator basically since Otani showed up with the angels. And uh, th- this guy sure felt like a few days ago, a fall guy. Um, Otani had, there been money transferred from Otani's bank account to the bookie, four and a half million dollars, in nine increments. And uh, it, it felt weird. It felt very strange. Uh, Mrs. Zaka gave an interview to, ESPN that apparently was entirely false. We don't really know all the contents of that interview. Tish James at ESPN published a nice little story there, but didn't reveal a lot about what he said other than once, once she tried to verify it turned out that a lot of it was false uh, and then was later retracted by him. Uh, This story breaks while the team is in Korea. I believe it's in between the two games or, or after the second game, I forget when that story breaks, but now we know a few more things. Story breaks. And it turns out that uh, there's a team meeting. At this team meeting, Mr. Zaku apologizes and says, hey, I'm a gambling addict. You're about to hear a bad story about me. I'm really sorry. Andrew Friedman, in English, importantly, the, the president of the Dodgers, addresses the team and says, 
points out, adds the detail that Mrs. Aku, that Otani had paid off Mrs. Aku's debts. And that's where the, that's where the uh, Otani was brought in. Now, Otani speaks a little bit of English, but up until this point, everything had been translated to him by his, tra- his translator. And apparently what we learned today at the press conference, uh, and we learned a few other things about Mrs. Aku basically lying about a lot of things, but we, what we heard today at the press conference was that Otani, that's, this was now news to Otani when Friedman said that, that some of his money had been used to pay off uh, this bookie. He understood enough of English and immediately kind of raised the red flag. And that's when the story changes from Oza- Otani paying off debts of a, of a, of a guy who was about to get his knees broken or something to four and a half million dollars being stolen from Otani's bank account, uh, wired to a bookie. Um, now we, had, we have also recently learned that Mr. Zaku lied about where he used to work. He said he worked for the Red Sox and Yankees translating for Okajima. Uh, Yankee for the Yankees, it would have been really briefly because Okajima didn't make the team that year, but for the Red Sox, it was a little bit longer. Uh, turns out he never was, never did either of those, never worked for either team was a translator overseas in Japan for American players playing in Japan. Um, but not, uh, did not work for a major league team previous to this. And that he had been lying about other things like his resume. So he had been lying about going to college at UC Irvine, never went to college at UC Irvine. And so I think that the story here is that Otani, at least of the facts that we have now, I mean, there's reason to question some of this stuff, but is that Otani was taken advantage of by a member of his entourage who was the one communicating with his representatives because he was translating for them. And then at some point figured out that he could communicate a wire transaction that ended up with an illegal bookie. Mm. So, so it looks as though Otani is innocent. I think that that's right now I'm leaning that way. I really thought that Otani was in trouble a few days ago. He met a bunch of my friends and said like, I don't know, man, like it sure looks like he was betting and we're going to learn that he tried to cover it up by blaming his translator. But I think everything's kind of lining up now that his translator seems like a con man. Wow. Uh, and this was his best friend. This was the, the, a member of his entourage was with him 24-7. Um, and, I, you know, I think rich people finances probably work a little different from the rest of us where someone can just wire $500,000 to some other guy uh, and no one bat, bats an eye. Or, or you trust the translator to be the one performing that communication. Interesting. So you don't see any suspension or anything for Shohei Otani? At Not unless point. the facts change, right? right. I, I mean, I, I think we actually have a fairly coherent story at this point. Um, there was an early change in the story, but it seems like that change was entirely Mizuzaka changing his story. And Otani, um, the, so the confusion was, was that Andrew Friedman told the team that Otani had paid off his debts, and that's what leaked out over the weekend. So it felt, it seemed like Otani changed the story, but the way that it's being that it was told during the press conference today is that Mizuzaka lied to Friedman, and then Otani like figured it out as soon as Friedman told the rest of the team. And then what Otani also said today was that he confronted uh, his translator in private afterwards. His, his translator confessed to all of it, um, and that. Uh, he's cooperating fully with the authorities, yada, yada, all that kind of stuff. Um, so I, I think, I think four and a half million, I think Otani had four and a half million dollars stolen from him. Wow. Yep. That, that's my guess. Now like, the facts could change. We could find out that someone here is lying. It really did feel like Otani and major league baseball were letting someone take the fall for their biggest star. Um, but I, I don't, I don't think that's true anymore. Interesting. So it blows over. I think it blows over. I think this is a problem for Otani. I don't think he's the first professional athlete to have to someone in his entourage, of? yeah, steal from them. Yeah, not not um, at all. And you know, I think you know, I, I we're going to talk about the problems of MLB's you know association with gambling. I was just going to bring in that relation up. to this, mm-hmm. but I actually don't. I, I think that that is a symbolic problem in relation to this particular scandal. But I think this scandal is much more old school than that. I mean, gambling was still sports gambling was still legal in California. This is some guy, again, like I said, probably a knee breaker who um, 
who was running an illegal sports gambling operation and Mizuzaka got in over his head. Amazing. So does this to you, I understand it's very different, but does this to you, it does to me, raise the flag that says, you know what? We, we're dodging a bullet here. It doesn't really have anything to do with our association with all these betting apps and these betting companies. But on the other hand, boy, oh boy, all we need is something like this to break with somebody else. And the opportunity for foul play, especially when you're doing prop bets. Oh, I bet you this pitch is a ball or this pitch is a strike. And you're dealing with guys, some guys like, Otani and judge who are getting paid hundreds of millions of dollars. But if you're, I don't know, a 33 year old guy who spent his whole career in the minor leagues and you finally get your shot and somebody says to you, you know, there's going to be a prop bet. And if you threw the sixth pitch at, and I'm making this all up, obviously, but if you throw the sixth pitch out of the strike zone, when you're in the game against the whatever team, that's going to be worth a lot of money to us and you'll get a lot of money. And you know, you're 33, you've been bouncing around the minor leagues. You don't have a lot of money. This is your one chance to cash in. It, I mean, the, the opportunities are there obviously. So d does this in your mind, raise the red flag and say, maybe we ought to, if you're major league baseball and the other sports, take a step back from this absolute bond that they've now created with gambling sites and such. Yeah, look, I, I think um, there's going to be a scandal at some point that's worse than this. This was almost a worst case scenario, right? Oh, Shohei Otani, mm -hmm. the biggest star in the sport. There was a, a chance in my mind that he was going to be banned for life two days ago. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, again, I don't think that's going to. I don't think that's the this the what the facts point to now. But you never know; it could it could change, and um, it's a problem. I'm going to sneeze. I'm going to apologize. Hold on. All right. So we got a we've got a comment from our good friend at Prim and Proper Sports. That's Sonia. Excuse me. And the good news is I'm going to be joining Sonia on her show, I believe, on April 2nd. That's on the same network, of course. So, Sonia, welcome. We've seen Sonia on the Mac and Jack debate show on Saturday mornings, and she's awesome, very knowledgeable. So, Sonia, thanks. Thanks for joining in. Hello, Sonia. Um, so what, what I was trying to say is, is that this could have been much worse. Um, I think that, you know, there's a couple of loopholes you have to worry about for the, for major league baseball. One is players are still allowed to gamble on sports, just not on baseball. That seems like a red, a, a danger zone to me. I, I would agree. And I, I think that the players should be banned from betting on sports entirely while they are major league baseball players, as should be anybody um, involved with the team. You know, I think, um, I used to be an expert on money laundering. I used to do a lot of work on anti-money laundering. And one thing that, um, one, one of the issues that we worked on was the illegal trade of animal parts. So goods from, from poached animals. And so you would, you would have, for example, uh, poached elephants uh, and their ivory would be smuggled to places and sold in the black market. And that was creating demand for elephant poaching and therefore was a real conservation problem. And one of the problems was, was that there was a legal trade in ivory. There are both farmed elephants that are farmed for their ivory, and that is that is very normal. Um, and then there are elephants that die of natural causes, and then their ivory is harvested. And there was a debate among conservationists about whether or not this should be something that we allow. So m much of that ivory was the, the legal ivory was sold by like parks who who would be who would you know use it to pay some of their expenses. And it, the debate basically landed on it is better off from a conservation perspective to destroy all of the ivory. So that way, whenever you see elephant tusks in a, in a shipyard, in a shipping container or somewhere else, you know that's illegal and you know that that's a, something to be investigated. I worry that there is a laundering of gambling or there could be a laundering of gambling where players or their, their associates walk into a sports book, a legal sports book, play some prop bets, and uh, most of them aren't on baseball, but some of them are. That I think is really dangerous. Um, we see this in European sports, and I, I, I especially like things like you know, like like you know, low-ranked soccer matches or undercard tennis matches, those types of things. 
And you worry if you're a pitcher for the athletics and you don't really care that much about winning a game if you're more susceptible to, to, to this kind of problem. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think that it's, it's something that baseball, I hope learns some lesson from here though. I will say, I, I think this scandal could or would have happened regardless of the rise in sports betting that's occurred recently. Understood. But, but sometimes one thing makes you, uh, reevaluate other things. So this is a close call, right? I mean, I mean, yeah. you, you make adjustments after a close call. Let me, let me ask this question. Why? And, and I think I know the rule and, and the, the, the rationale, but but I want to hear your rationale because then I'll then ask this the, the, the return question, which I think brings up, if this goes the way I think it's going to go, where the problem lies deeply. Why are baseball players not allowed to bet on baseball? Easy answer, right? Yeah, because they might affect the outcome of the bet. Okay. But why then, where do they see the difference? Because they do allow them, as you say, to bet on other major sports. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think there's two things, actually. So one is that, you know, they're, you know, imagine them betting on something that's not sports. That would be okay in theory, right? They could go play poker. Um, and, and so betting on basketball, you know, even though they might know some athletes pretty well, I mean, lots of people know athletes pretty well. And so I, I don't think that there's any risk there of the basketball bet being a problem. I'm concerned about the laundering of bets. Um, I think that the second thing, is that major league baseball players are not under their independent contractors. So the moment the season's over and really when they're not in the ballpark, you know, I, I think there's reason that the players you need might say, like, don't tell me what to do. And right. so, you, know, so you, you sort of were touching on what I'm saying. We see this all the time where there's a football game or a hockey game, something at the garden and they pan into the crowd and Aaron Judge or whomever, I don't want to see anybody. Judge name. and Volpe are sitting there at the Rangers game. Yeah. Yeah. With with Michael Jordan or yeah. whomever. Like, like they're, they're, they're at the game with Baker Mayfield. And oh, yeah, well, Baker and Volpe are buddies or whatever. Like, like who, but I don't even care about the, who the players are and the names. It's just this baseball player is tight with this football player or this baseball player is tight with that basketball player. And if I'm a Yankee, and I'm not allowed to bet on the Padres against the Dodger game because I might somehow have insider information because we're in the same sport. I think that very same temptation and the very same possibility happens that I might have information about the NFL because I call quarterback X or linebacker Y and we hang out all the time or we, or we both are betting on the hockey game which all these things to me lead to the fact that insider information, because a lot of these guys are in the same groups and represented by the same agents or whatever. Um, and they could know just like I could know if I'm a baseball player that so-and-so is injured on the Padres, but they're not reporting it because it's day to day or he stayed out late too much that night. And, I could know the same thing about. I mean, the this is a reason game. not to allow sport. This is why the United States Congress should reinstate their ban on sports betting, and why the U.S. Supreme Court should not have overturned it. And this this um, is my point, right? There's, right. There's I, I mean, this, but this is not baseball. Abuse. Like, I don't think this is a baseball argument. Like, lots of people know things about athletes that affect bets, um, and it's why I would be very careful if if I, if you're thinking about anyone listening here is thinking about going to put a lot of money down on a baseball game or any sporting event. Because you don't know the information that the person you're betting against, either the house or some other person, is um, is is privy to, and that's that information is very very powerful. Um, so you know, I I think um, I again I think this is a reason why I think sports betting should be illegal. I don't think it's a, that that particular argument you're making is something that Major League Baseball really you know has any business in. That said, I do think that there is an appearance of impropriety that we should be worried about um, with with athletes, and um, you know, I, I I I I'm glad that baseball has a legend of the Black Sox uh, because I think it really does inoculate baseball against a lot of these things because we see sports leagues in a lot of places throughout the world have this problem, and I never want to watch a sporting a sporting event and wonder whether or not you know that 
player drop the ball because they, you know, they owe some money to a bookie. Um, that's 100%. really scary. Once the integrity of the sport is gone, yep. then there's no reason to watch yep. the sport. I feel that. Like, and, I'll just watch and a And that's movie. why baseball has a lifetime ban. And that's why, I, I mean, I think there was a version of this story where Otani was not placing bets uh, on baseball, uh, but was paying off the debt of a friend of his that did. And I think in that scenario, I think baseball should should suspend him. Now, that is not what anybody is saying now. And so if that was the case, then, then we have lying as a problem and then there's a bigger suspension we got to talk about. I don't think it's something that baseball should have. Um, I don't think it rises to the level of a lifetime ban if he's not betting on baseball. But, you know, I, you know, if Botani was placing bets on baseball, even if he was on his team to win, I don't know, right? Like, I, I think that there's a reason why the baseball has this rule and I think it's a good rule. I don't think Pete Rose should be allowed in the Hall of Fame, um, even posthumously. Because I think it's a powerful signal that this is not something that you do, period, ever, no matter what. And again, you have to maintain the integrity of every pitch and every game. Because once you start hearing, hopefully it never happens. But if you start hearing that this was rigged or this guy didn't, this is, this is actually to take it in a whole different direction. I know people love the stories and this one is, I forget exactly who it was. I think it was Denny McLean pitching and Mickey Mantle was up and Denny McLean grooved one. So Mickey could get his 500th home run or his 536th home run. And, you know, like it didn't matter at the time. He just wanted Mickey to get one more trip around the bases. That bothers me. I don't like that. There was a play in football a number of years ago. I think Brett Favre got tackled by somebody on the Giants. Maybe it was Michael Strahan so that he could. And and, and the quarterback, I, guess, I think it was Brett Favre, but I don't know the particulars. But instead of rushing away, he sort of just took a knee, supposedly. And then the football guy on the Giants got the sack. So he tied the all-time record for sacks. I mean. I think those types of things hurt the credibility of the sport. And so yeah. I don't want to see any of that happen because of gambling, especially. Look, if you're the last batter of a perfect game, I want you to try to get a hit. Yes. Even if, even if it doesn't matter, even if you really like the guy and you, you think it'd be cool if he got a perfect game. Right. I mean, that, that that's, I think, part of the sport. And I think for the most part, that's how athletes work. I do too. So when those little things happen, it's bothersome. What would make it worse is if we found out that, you know, quarterback X took a knee so player Y could get the sack record and there was gambling involved to make them both rich or somebody else rich or something like that. Like, oh, my goodness. Now, now we're really talking. Like, do I even believe anything? And, you know, there's every game, every game we watch, there's a ball that's called oh, yeah. a strike. That's like, if we start to question everything, then you can't believe the sport. And then why watch? Yeah, look, I agree. And again, I think this is a close call. And I hope that baseball recognizes that it's a close call. Um, you know, one question I always have about gambling and, and sports is how much money is really at stake for, for baseball. So for the gambling is a very popular, a very um, uh, lucrative industry, right? It makes, makes money, makes a profit. Um, the house always wins, or at least if the house in sports is doing it right. I wonder how much money baseball is kind of sacrificing its integrity for. Um, I can't imagine it's that much money. Right? Well, I, I, I mean, made this I'm sure the it's in day. the tens of millions of dollars, maybe a hundred million dollars. But baseball makes you know many billions of dollars a year. I think six, seven billion dollars a year, or something like that. I don't think that it's worth it. And, and I and I I wish we could reevaluate this. Because I really think that we're talking about like money on the equivalent of hot dog sales, not concessions, but hot dog sales, not money on the equivalent of TV contracts. Tell me if I'm wrong here. The money is coming from advertisements, yep. basically on TV, radio and billboards at the stadium. Yes. Yeah. There's some like official partnership stuff, too. But for the most part, that's it. All right. So. Let, let's say the Yankees have that star insurance badge on their uniform now. All right. Not a big fan of it. It's it's annoying. But let's say for whatever reason, that company and the Yankees end their deal. 
they're getting 25 million a year or something like that. Do, doesn't it make sense that if the Yankees and that company break off their deal that Toyota or sure. Northeast streaming sports or Pepsi Cola is going to say, Oh, that, that part of the uniform is now available for 25 million. Yeah. We'll pay it. W wouldn't somebody else jump in? Yeah. And the world, and, and, and I hope that that isn't a gambling organization. Co right? Well, I mean correct. So, so if they, if they say, you know what, this was too close, it's, we don't like the optics. So we're going to take down the gambling ads in the stadiums. We're going to take away the gambling ads on TV and radio. All right. Maybe they're paying a little more. I don't think they are, but wouldn't, Toyota or Pepsi or Coca Cola. Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. Like I don't, else I don't pick up those them, ads anyway. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, whatever. DraftKings buys a a, a a a you know spot on the outfield. Yeah, maybe maybe they're buying, paying a little more than the next guy, but the marginal cost is not that high. Correct. It's not new revenue. It's not like they're getting a piece of the gambling itself. Though, for example, ESPN is is trying to get in on, on that game. Um. And, and I just really don't, I wonder how much money it is. I wonder how many people are actually involved. My, my instinct is 2% of the people watching will ever gamble. Um, there's a wonderful YouTube video today by the, the channel Windover Productions. They do a lot of uh, great videos on trains and planes and logistics. And they did one on sports gambling. And one thing that they pointed out is I think the worst case scenario, which is in Australia. And in Australia, sports gambling has been around for a long, or gambling in general has been a long, around for a longer time, but especially sports, sports gambling. And it's become quite addictive for a lot of Australians. It's become a real problem in Australia. Something like like one out of every, one, the average Australian, as is average, spends about thousand dollars on gambling or loses about thousand dollars to gambling. Something like that, which is a lot of money. I mean, that's we're talking about, you know, two to three percent of GDP at that point. And the U.S. isn't there yet, and I hope the U.S. doesn't get there. But this is how addictions work. And my problem with Major League Baseball getting in bed with gambling is actually less about these types of scandals and more about, I think it's uncomfortable that Major League Baseball is trying to create addicts, really harmful addicts. And um, that's that. those are the strategies that these sports gambling places use. They get you hooked. They give you free bets. One of the great things this video pointed out that I didn't know because I don't use them is that if you lose a bunch of hands, a bunch of rounds, They'll actually give you a free bet, quote unquote, um, which you can't redeem for money, but you can use to kind of offset some of your losses. The math works out so that you don't offset all of your losses. But the idea being is that it kind of keeps you going, keeps you gambling, keeps you potentially losing money. Isn't that look? Isn't that what they say drug dealers do? Right? I'll give you your first hit for free or whatever. I, I mean, I guess, but like same idea. Like, that's the idea. Like, and that that is a um, they know what they're doing, and and everybody involved, right? All of those media companies that are partnering with sports betting, real good, honorable people, Ken Rosenthal, right? Best journalist we have in this sport is sponsored by gambling, right? And, and frankly, he had some thoughts about that during the Otani, when the Otani stuff broke that were, I think, pretty honest and pretty uncomfortable with that. Um, John Boy Media, my favorite podcast about baseball. Those guys rule. They're great. They're fun. A tremendous amount of their advertising is gambling. And, um, you know, I'm glad that I don't have to choose between not having a career and taking that advertising money. Because for Major League Baseball, again, they'll find other advertisers. They have other ways of making money. They're going to be fine. But for media, I think that's a little bit less of a, you can't really make that assumption. I think that a lot of media places in sports are being held up by gambling advertising. And so I'm just glad that I I didn't choose to, to go into a career in baseball media like I thought of at one point. Because I think that'd be a really tough choice. Absolutely. Absolutely. A couple of quick comments. We, I think we addressed these, but Angelo says, I find it interesting that Otani didn't know that money was stolen from his account, yeah. but in less than 24 hours, he identified that 4.5 million. I think he addressed that. And I, 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 I can buy the argument that when you have millions and millions of dollars and you're trusting other people, you're not necessarily watching your bank account every day of the week. Yeah. Rich um, people are like, like rich people. Finances don't make any sense. I think you could easily figure it out when you go like, look at my statement. What if, where, what happened to the money that you took? Right. But I'm, I'm not sure how, how often yeah. they, they have other people. He could have other people looking I, at his money and saying, I hey, believe he good. bought a Lamborghini for the Dodger player, Joe Kelly, who convinced him to come to the Dodgers. Like, I think it's fairly normal for Otani to be sending money places um, or at least not, you know, religiously checking his many bank accounts and probably as a complex financial arrangement too to avoid taxes.
That is correct. So I heard about Otani. I don't know if he did it or gambled uh, or the agent did, and we don't know the whole story. And I think think the whole story will come out. The good news here is that the the reason why the whole story is going to come out is that this is the subject of what uh, what will be a trial. Um, There's a federal investigation into this bookie. This bookie is being prosecuted. And so that's how we all knew about this, how everybody learned about this. And that will be public record when that uh, enters, assuming that there's a charge and a plea. Mm -hmm. So listen, we've we've spent a lot of time on this. We only have 15 minutes left. I know everyone out there in the audience. We're going to talk about some baseball. Screw the the 500 minutes. So let's go to this one. There's a trade. Uh, The Athletic is reporting that a trade is coming. What what do you know about that? So one, Ben Wardfett is going to have to find a home. Um, He is out of options. I think he's probably a major league catcher, even if not a great one. Uh, and I think the Yankees don't need him because they have Austin Wells and Jose Trevino. They probably held on to Wardrett this long just in case somebody got injured. But I think that it makes sense that they're going to try to find a home for him and try to trade him, hopefully get an infielder or something like that in return. Um, the Yankees are short an infielder. We just, we just mentioned that. And I think that I, I think that I would not be shocked if they find a right-handed hitting infielder. You know, Donovan Solano was the free agent we've been talking about. Maybe there's a reason why no major league team has signed him. Um, but someone like that, I, I think that there's a pretty good possibility. Someone who can play a little bit of third, a little bit of first pinch hit, but also someone that won't cost a ton, doesn't have a huge salary. I don't know who that player is, uh, but I think that someone is going, I wouldn't be shocked if that's what, what the Yankees get in return for Ward Fett. Um, Ward Fett probably could improve some other teams catching and he's young enough and talented enough that, you know, maybe some team thinks that they can, they can kind of find some magic with him. Um, so I think that trade is, is absolutely coming. Um, but, uh, I have no idea who, who it would be. Okay. So that's, that's the rumor. The rumor is a trade, right? It doesn't even say Rort fit. It just says there's a trade. Yes. Okay. An imminent Yankee trade coming any minute. Oh, and more is that would be the trade. The question is if, is anyone, if anyone else would be the trade, right? Would anyone else be involved there? I mean, I, I saw something. It might've been in one of the comments on start spreading the news. It might've been on Twitter somewhere. Did, I, I don't think this should ever happen. But let's say the Yankees at the end of the year re-sign Juan Soto at 45 million and they look at their numbers and they realize, oh my goodness, we, we can't afford him and judge. And do you think there's a world where you trade Aaron Judge? No. No, I don't think so either. Okay. We put that to rest quickly. So the Yankees named their fifth starter to replace Garrett Cole for the time being. We have to hope Cole comes back quickly i i tend to doubt he will but anyway who what do i know i don't know any of the medicals tell us about the fifth starter louise heel man it's exciting um you know heel i think we all forgot about um he was a 2021 player played six starts was kind of their spot starter that year um and then 2022 he has tommy john surgery he actually has it while he's in the minors which sucks because for him because he doesn't get service time for it or paid like a major leaguer but he has the tommy john surgery he recovered. He was basically, if, if I remember the reports correctly, basically ready by the end of last year, but um, they shut him down after his rehab and said, okay, come back normal for spring training. Um, I don't know if anyone here remembers Luis Heal. We used to compare him to Dell and Patances. So a guy with just incredible stuff, but not great control. Three really, really strong pitches, I think maybe even four really strong pitches. He could throw 98, 99. And um, now he's throwing 99, 100. And he's got great control. And the thing he always had, which was incredible, was just incredible movement on his fastball. And I, you know, when back in, in 2021, he had really bad control. He, he he walked, I think, six. I think he had one game where he had six walks and one hit. Um, I, He looked like a player who would not be a major league player because he couldn't throw strikes. And I watched a lot of his spring training starts. And I think he can throw strikes. I don't think he's a you know a strong control guy, but you know he walked three batters per nine in the in the spring. He had a couple of times where he lost it. He, he you know walked a guy, and then recovered and and was great. Um, I, I think there's a world where Luis Heal is like one of the best starters in Major League Baseball. I mean his stuff is just so good. If if he could be a below average control guy, I think he's an ace. And I think the real question is is one can he stay healthy. And two, is he a below average control guy or is he a horrible control guy? Um, you know, I think 
the possibility still exists that he gets converted to the bullpen and he's down Batanzas, which would be great. The Yankees could use a guy like that. But right now they need a starter. I think they were expecting Will Warren to be their fifth starter when Cole went down. Um, in fact, I think they sent Heal down early in spring training. Like they cut him early so we could go work on stuff and be ready for you know midseason or be a reliever or something. And he just kind of forced his way to, to the top. Um, you can't teach 100. He used to throw 98. Now he throws 100. You can't teach his movement. You can't teach having multiple plus pitches in addition to the killer fastball. He's got a 92 mile an hour changeup, which looks sick. He's got a 91 mile an hour slider, which looks incredible. I I mean, I, I think th- I think this is a player you can get excited about, even if you want to be cautious and say, let's see him do major league control first. I love your optimism. Each time we do this, I get more optimistic. So which teams in the American League, EJ? I, I should really talk to you every day because then I, I start to go, the Yankees are up the creek. This is terrible. This is not good. Um, and we're not going to have time to really delve into the big debate on start spreading the news yesterday, my points about Aaron Judge and center field. But we could save that for another day. But who do you see as the Yankees – biggest competition not just in the al east but in the al for the wild card or the pennant or whatever i think i think most people think the blue J- uh, excuse me the orioles will win the division so the yankees might be a wild card team i mean i so think he's over think? the orioles for the division we've talked about that I, I think it's the astros right and i think it's been the astros and will be the astros um Still a really elite team. Still not that old of a team. If you look, there's a couple of guys in that roster that get up there. Jose Abreu, Jose Altuve. But Alex Bregman is 30. Kyle Tucker's 27. Jordan Alvarez is 27. You know, they have some questions about their pitching staff that I think are legitimate, and I would not be shocked to see Jordan Montgomery end up there. Blake Snell almost did. And, but look, they signed Josh Hader. This is still a, you know, that, that's that's a pretty good move. They still have a killer bullpen. They can hit. They can field. Um, they won 90 games last year, which is not nothing. So, you know, I think they're a stronger team than the, the Rangers. I think they're certainly stronger than the Mariners in the West. Anybody in the AL Central, which is an awful division. Um, and so I think that they're the real competition for the Yankees in the, in the AL. And frankly, I think the only real competition for the Yankees I don't think the Rangers are, are. I think they're in that wild card conversation, but I don't think they're a pull away kind of team. And you don't um, think the Blue, you don't think the Orioles are. I, I think they could potentially be, but I think that you would need a significant step forward friendship for a bunch of players. And I think if they were serious about fighting to the nail in this division, I think Jackson Holiday would be in the would be in the major leagues right now. And it's it's incredible to me that they're going to play games with him for a month when it's going to be a very very tight division. Interesting. Without him, right, because he's starting the year in the minor leagues. Yep. All right, a couple of quickies, and then we're done for the evening, unfortunately. So, which Yankee – I know you hate this statistic, but which Yankee pitcher leads the team in wins? Rodon. Interesting, because he did not have a good spring. Yeah, but, I mean, I watched a lot of his starts. I think he, he, he was clearly working on a third pitch. And I think that that didn't work out for him, but he, you know, he's been a two pitch pitcher and been pretty good. Which Yankee player leads the team in home runs? I think it's going to be Mr. Aaron judge. Pretty easy. Which Yankee player leads the team in OPS plus? I think it will be Mr. Aaron judge. Wow. Which Yankee player leads the team in on base percentage? Uh, Mr. Juan Sardo, uh, the only other other option there. Um, <laughs> look, I, here's the thing. You know, I, I, I love Juan Sardo and I'm excited to watch him play. I think that we forget how good Judge has been the last two seasons, especially, you know, the 2022 season and then the first two months of the 2023 season before he hit the wall. 20, first three Literally. months, whatever it was. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, like Judge was on track for 60 plus home runs again. Um, that's incredible. And so um, Soto is a great player. I hope he's with the Yankees for a long time, but I don't think it's close. All right. So how many games does Aaron Judge play in 2024? 150. 
Wow. Oh, my goodness. All right, EJ, listen, I'm going to call you every day. Every time I feel like writing an article where I say this is doomsday, I'm just going to call you and then I'm going to write. If Aaron, All right. I don't think the Yankees are winning the pennant. I don't even know if the Yankees are going to make it to the wild card. The injury to Cole, to me, is scary. I think the rest of the rotation is not what it could be or should be. We've talked about the fact that they don't have enough infielders. They don't have a leadoff hitter. They're counting on, like, Anthony Volpe somehow becoming a productive hitter. Maybe he will be. Um, they're counting on LeMahieu and Rizzo being healthy. They're counting on Stanton coming back and having a good year. I mean, there's so many up in the air things. And I'm worried about Aaron Judge's health. That's my big concern. I, If he plays 150 games, I think the Yankees are all, it's all good. Yeah, See, look, I'm, if he plays 140 games, let's say he misses he a couple of weeks with a, an games, injury, right? L- listen, that would be phenomenal. Yep. I, I'm just worried with the toe. He had core issues. He's tired in the middle of March. I'm like, oh, boy, here we go. If, if he plays the bulk of the season, that changes my outlook completely because you have Aaron Judge, and he's amazing. And if he's playing and he's healthy, he's going to be great because he is great. And then you have him and Soto. I mean, that, to me, I don't know if we've ever seen that in our lifetime. That's, to me, is like Maris Mandel. Soto doesn't miss time, right? Soto plays every game. He's young. That's Garrick Ruth, DiMaggio Garrick, right? Like, two great, great hitters back-to-back. Like, I don't think we've ever seen anything quite like that in our our lifetime, have we? No, we haven't. We we haven't on the Yankees. And, you know, there are other, like, duos in Major League Baseball which are on, which are close, right? So, you know, if you look at, uh, I don't know. Alvarez and Altuve or Mookie Betts and Freddie Freeman or Ronald Acuna and whoever is batting next to him. Right. And, uh, and Matt Olson, those are really good duos. But I think that if you just take what these players have done recently, I, I think it's actually pretty clear that judge and, and Soto are the best of them. And uh, that's pretty great. That's, that's, there's, that's going to be fun. There's probably not a better home run hitter in the game than judge. Correct. Oh, clearly not. Okay, and there is nobody better than Juan Soto. He's the leader right now in active players in on base percentage. Yep. Plus, he hits well. And otherwise, I'll just like he walks and gets hit by pitches. He's he hits. He hits for power. He's oh my goodness. Yeah, he's also I think just he's fun to watch. I think he's a good guy. Like I, yeah. I watched a video today of him. He went down to the Yankees Dominican complex, which he didn't have to do. And he addressed all the 16 year old kids there. And I guarantee you every single one of those kids idolized him, right? Yes. Dominican kids, you know, 19 year old Dominican or whatever, 16 year old Dominican kids today, like Juan Soto is their hero. Um, and uh, I think that's something that's really special. And, and, and I, I like Juan Soto every, every minute I do. You know, I, for, for some reason I had in my head that he was kind of a, just just kind of a player who played with a little bit more of an edge, more of a Donaldson than, than anything. And I was just wrong, right? Soto, Soto is not only a wonderful baseball player, but, you know, I think somebody who I, I hope to watch for 15 more years on the Yankees, and, and that that's really fun. Tim Cable wrote a great article today on Start Spreading the News where he talked about the fact that Trevor Bauer, maybe Otani. He named a couple of our oldest Chapman. You know, there's guys that have these things of uh, Josh Donaldson that they just become hard to root for because of all this other noise and stuff. And we don't have to get into it all. But he said, none of that seems to surround Judge. None of that seems to surround Cole. None of that seems to surround Volpe. And it's fun to have the stars of your team be guys you can root for. And I think we put Juan Soto in that class. Hopefully that all stays true through their whole career. They don't ever let us down because it's more fun for me, at least when I can watch the Yankees and say, you know what? These are guys I can root for because they, they seem to be good guys. I mean, look, Anthony Rizzo, John Carlos Stanton, Claybert Torres. I mean, I, I even think about like a Clay Holmes or a Nestor Cortez. Like I, I, I agree with you. And I think all of the bad apples are gone now. Right. Aaron Hicks, I don't think it was a bad person in the same way as some of these these players are, but I think was a uh, was not in the best headspace as a major league player. Josh Donaldson, I think, was kind of a bad person. 
Mm-hmm. Um, Eraldus Chapman, kind of a bad person. Domingo Herman, arguably bad person or bad or, or was reformed or dysfunctional, however you want to say it. You know, I, I have a lot of confidence that Soto and Judge and Rizzo and Stanton are Trevino. I mean, just go down the list are people who I think are leaders on this team and, and, and will be focused and trying to win. Um, you know, we can talk about Verdugo maybe, but, but, you know, I, I think so far Verdugo has been a pretty stand up guy too. I don't know if you saw the story that Verdugo uh, bought haircuts for all the minor leaguers in, in spring training. That's he, awesome. He brought a barber and that charged a hundred bucks a pop and they all got really nice haircuts. And that's, I think a really good thing. That's awesome. All right. We've reached the top of the hour. This has been the Start Spreading the News podcast brought to you by Artemisia Publishing, who published the wonderful book 365.2, Going the Distance, written by me. All right, my friends, have yourselves a happy and wonderful and terrific Monday. Opening day is just a few days away. Thanks, EJ. Have a good night.